Welcome everyone, both in the room and online. Uh, my name is Melissa Begg and I have the great honor and pleasure of being Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone today to the next in the Dean's Lecture Series on Inequality and Opportunity. This series has been created to highlight research that examines and promotes the well-being of um, Americans from marginalized groups and, and really all Americans. And we're thrilled to have a scholar of the caliber of Dr. Bradley Hardy here uh, to, to speak in this series. So we have an opportunity to come together, explore the complex system uh, of um, many racist structures and policies that result in inequities. All right, but if we, if we create them through our policies, we can fix them through our policies. So I'm really excited about this lecture and hearing more from Dr. Hardy about this. And uh, so right now I'm, I'm delighted to introduce the moderator for today's session, that is our wonderful colleague, Dr. Jane Waldvogel. Dr. Waldvogel is the Compton Foundation Centennial Professor for the, for the Prevention of Children's and Youth Problems. She's also co-director of the Columbia Population Research Center, a visiting professor at the Center for Analysis and Social Exclusion at the London School of Economics. So Jane, you get around. So um, Dr. Waldvogel, as you know, has written extensively on the impact of public policies on the well-being of children and families. And her most recent book, too Many Children Left Behind, the U.S. Achievement Gap in Comparative Perspective assesses how social mobility varies in the U.S. compared with Australia, Canada, and the U.K. She's written a number of other notable books, too, including Securing the Future, Investing in Children from Birth to College, Britain's War on Poverty, Steady Gains and Stalled Progress, Inequality in the Black-White Test Score Gap, and What Children Need. Professor Waldfogel has served as president of the Association for Public Policy Analysis and Management and is a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, as well as a fellow at the American Academy of Political and Social Science. So, Jane, uh, thank you. I'm glad to turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Melissa. And um, it's really a thrill to introduce Bradley Hardy and welcome him to the School of Social Work. Thank you so much, Bradley, for coming up today. Uh, Bradley Hardy is an associate professor in the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Uh, he's also a non-resident senior fellow in economic studies at Brookings and a research fellow with the Institute for Economic Equity at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, he's a busy guy. Uh, in addition to that, he's affiliated with Wisconsin's Institute for Research on Poverty, University of Kentucky's Center for Poverty Research, and our own Center for Poverty and Social Policy here at Columbia. Uh, we have the good fortune of talking with Bradley uh, pretty much every Tuesday as part of our poverty and social policy group and have learned so much from those conversations. So we're very grateful for that. Um, Bradley has a very large research agenda around income volatility, intergenerational mobility, safety net policy, and racial economic inequality. And we're just so looking forward to hearing from you today. And thank you very much in advance. Thanks. Okay, great. So just great to be in person um, and great to be able to visit with you all here uh, at Columbia. And so, you know, when we were talking about the, uh, the subject matter, I thought it would be useful to kind of pull in some of the work I've done, uh, thinking about state level policies and how that relates to racial inequality. I think it's topical both, you know, today and yesterday. Let's see, make sure we got all our stuff together here. We good? Okay. All right. Yeah. So sounds good here. And, uh, you know, so I think like this will be topical for folks who are thinking about this, both at the ground level and also kind of more 30,000 foot level as well. Um, so let's go on and kick it off. Um, you know, I think that many folks here in the social work school or across the nation are focused on inequality at varying levels. Uh, so right here, I'm going to start to show you some pictures uh, that come out of the shop that Maggie Jones, Raj Chetty, and co-authors have been uh, sort of spearheading. And this shop is really focused on uh, census data and other data sources to think about intergenerational economic mobility. And so this sort of heat map is essentially showing you that the areas in red are, are really producing lower levels of economic mobility, upward economic mobility. And as you can see that the, the Southern states uh, seem to pair, sort of fare relatively poorly on this sort of metric. You know, children who are growing up in, in families with lower income are 
are a bit less likely to land um, in higher income as adults. And so we see this on a sort of broad aggregate level, but you know, ultimately people aren't living their lives on a national scale, they're, they're living their lives locally. And so you, know, you see this at the city level here in the, the city of New York, um, obviously one of the densest urban areas in, in the world really. Um, and you see these pockets of lower upward mobility, right? So lower social mobility, lower economic upward mobility uh, within the city of New York. Um, this is a very specific context, but we can think about this also within uh, my hometown of Durham, North Carolina. Uh, and so both prosperous cities, very different cities, uh, different economic bases, uh, Durham very much uh, leaning on a research and biotechnology economy, uh, but a very dynamic and growing economy that nevertheless has these pretty clear geographic uh, patterns of, of low upward mobility, right? Again, red is bad here. So this is just a, another form of inequality and one that I think a lot of folks care about, how will their kids fare uh, in adulthood? So kind of with that as a backdrop, you know, I'm coming at this asking questions about the state level. And I think that the reality here is that for as much as your city council, your county council, your mayor, for as much as they can do, and in some instances, they have substantial financial resources, nevertheless, you know, look, state government has a lot to say about redistribution. Um, and importantly, the state government has a lot to say about the redistribution using federal dollars. Right, so not that there aren't important state level resources to bring to bear to these issues, but state policymakers, legislators, they're oftentimes making choices with federal resources. And I wanna kind of go through some of the research uh, evidence, including some stuff I've done to talk about how some of these resources are being used in some states. And so it's hard to paint with a wide brush, but there are some pretty consistent patterns that, that emerge in, in the data. So. Um, we can get into at least some of that here. So, you know, I'll focus on two studies that are relatively recent. Uh, the first with Trevon Logan uh, from Ohio State and, and John Parman at William & Mary, where we were really trying to think about kind of long run factors that have driven uh, so-called regional you know, inequality in the US context. And, and so here I really learned a lot from folks who think hard about economic history. And we kind of had this look back and wanted to connect it to current day outcomes. And that's kind of where I came in. And then the second piece was with uh, collaborators at the, the Center for American Progress in DC. And we were kind of taking a more recent snapshot in 2019 to think hard about the relationship between state policies and race. And, and so, you know, the work with Trevon and John actually helped to inform uh, the work with the Center for American Progress. Um, but I think that there's a you know, pretty clear set of through lines uh, throughout both of, those, about both of those projects. So how do state social welfare policies respond? I should be a bit more specific. There's a whole array of you know, state policies. Here, I'm thinking about state social welfare policies um, and with an emphasis, uh, emphasis on sort of traditional welfare programs. We'll talk a little bit more about those, those definitions. Well, I'm gonna kind of show you what I'm talking about, but I'm gonna tell you first, much of the current day policy that we see does appear to be very much influenced uh, through the valence of race and the racial composition of the state population. Now, again, you could think about this at different geographic levels, but we're thinking about the state level. Some of that's about data availability, um, but you obviously are thinking about your city, your county as well. And again, part of the point is that uh, the city or county is very much heavily influenced by the, the policy choices that the state apparatus is, is making and imposing upon them. Um, but black households are typically more likely to reside in states where the welfare policies tend to be a bit more punitive, um, both in terms of the generosity of the benefits that are provided to families, but also the sanctioning policies, right? So there's a whole bunch of rules and, and regulations around how to remain on a welfare or uh, cash assistance role, uh, food stamp uh, you know, assistance role, things like that. And there's a whole host of consequences for 
maybe making mistakes or deviating from a, a training regimen. And so the caseworker and you know, the school of social work will train a whole host of folks who will go on to be case managers, work on the ground with clients and their families. Well, we know there's quite a bit of discretion. And we see that in the data. Um, and I say we, I'm saying there's a large literature that's sort of documented that there's quite a bit of discretion. Some of this has a regional and state level gradient to it, very much associated with race. But even within region and within state, we do have this evidence, and this is cross-disciplinary, that again, you know, uh, Black families in particular, um, though not solely Black families, have typically faced harsher sanctions. So, um, you know, some of this work is um, with co-authors and former students. Uh, Zach Perlin has done a lot of this interesting work uh, on traditional cash welfare programs. Uh, Zach is still affiliated with the uh, uh, the Poverty and Social Policy Center here. So, you know, we have this sort of evidence that, that comes together uh, pointing towards this issue. And so let's jump right in. I mean, first off, this is a snapshot of, of work with the Center for American Progress. And before we even get into thinking about relationships between um, social welfare programs and race, we just want to think about the relationship between the benefit levels in traditional cash welfare or TANF, temporary assistance for needy families, and, and the state level poverty rate. And so the first linkage or relationship that you can kind of see when you take this kind of quick snapshot is, well, it, you know, it appears that the states that are providing sort of relatively lower uh, TANF monthly benefits, they're at least correlated with having higher poverty rates. We're not making causal statements here, but there is a pattern that emerges. Um, this pattern is robust um, over the past, say, 20 years. We just picked a year for brevity uh, to sort of make the point. And then within this, if you see the, you know, the color coding, um, you know, you're going to start to see this pattern where the southern states tend to have the higher poverty rates. And, and here they're actually tending to have relatively lower uh, cash assistance benefits on a monthly basis. Um, now, I should say, um, I'm a guy born in Arkansas, raised in North Carolina, educated in Georgia and Kentucky, a little bit of a stint in D.C., so I love the Southeast, right? Um, but the South is not going to look good on a lot of these metrics. Um, but um, I think it's important that I am thinking about the state level, and you have a whole lot of people doing great work within the Southern states um, both in human services programs, nonprofits, and the like. So with these sorts of 30,000-foot view studies, I'm going to be giving you sort of mean statistics on average, but there's a whole bunch of diversity and heterogeneity within these states and within these cities. So it's obvi obviously important to keep in mind. Um, so we'll see this pattern, though, that um, states where you have a smaller Black population are going to look to be a bit more generous on social welfare policies, particularly the TANF program. TANF is just one example though. So another way of thinking about this is to use a measure called the TANF to poverty ratio. This is just simply a, a measure of coverage. So you know, to what degree and extent does the, the program cover the state's poor residents? And again, for broader context, the interesting thing to note about this temporary assistance uh, for needy families program is that it is a so-called block grant. So we're talking about federal dollars that states have great discretion uh, to use as they see fit, right? So that's a, it's an important point. Um, largely federal dollars, some state dollars, but where the state has discretion with respect to how to use it, there's a whole bunch of activities that we might think are useful to fund that are not explicit cash assistance, maybe job training, transportation assistance, stuff like that. But nevertheless, many experts in the study of poverty and inequality do acknowledge that the program has historically had an income support role, and that is still an important part of what these programs perhaps should be doing. And so when you're thinking about a measure of coverage here, for example, this TANF poverty ratio of 20 would say that if you have 100 families where the kids are in poverty, then 20 are covered by the program. That's how to think about this ratio. And so again, if we're looking on this vertical axis and we have our, our measure of coverage, and then on the horizontal axis, 
we see the, the population rate, the proportion that's black at the state level. Again, we see this clear pattern that's emerging now. Uh, states with a higher proportion of black residents tend to have these lower coverage rates on TANF. Again, not one-to-one -one, and you see exceptions, but this pattern starts to emerge. Uh, the case study of Mississippi looms large, and this has been in the news over the past couple of months. Uh, folks may be familiar with this, but sort of a high profile case study wherein the state's welfare TANF dollars uh, were ostensibly used to fund the building of sports complexes uh, within the state's university system. And so this is a nice example of, hey, look, uh, the block grant, there's great autonomy for the states to use it. This is a clear misuse of the TANF funds. And then let's just see how they're doing. Well, a ratio of four, right? A hundred kids living in poverty, four of those covered in TANF in Mississippi. And so this is very troubling. Uh, prior to the mid nineties reform of welfare, it would have been typical to see a TANF to poverty ratio, certainly not 100%, but you would have seen this sort of in the neighborhood of the 60s or 70s, I think. That would have been not um, anomalous in, in that time period. And, and so again, there's probably a larger conversation about the aspects of the prior incarnation of cash welfare that, that was effective or ineffective. But I think even some of the architects of the mid 90s welfare reform um, have acknowledged that perhaps this was an unintended consequence, that they didn't expect to see this, this coverage rate go quite so low. And so it's sort of more of the same here. If we take that first figure, you know, I'll, I'll toggle back. Initially, we were just looking at this sort of simple relationship between state poverty and the TANF maximum benefit. And if we then kind of go back to this and say, look, let's look at the association between that max benefit and the state's racial composition. Again, this sort of same relationship emerges. There's a pattern where the South is less generous. The South does in fact have a higher proportion of black residents. Um, and so this is a pattern that we see in the TANF program, but it's not confined uh, to TANF alone. If we think about unemployment insurance benefits, and, and we know from our, our study throughout the social sciences uh, that uh, black Americans face uh, higher unemployment rates, uh, they face higher income volatility, um, and this is very much a function of a whole range of current day and historical factors, but also including uh, the sorts of sectors that Black Americans are more likely to work in, uh, where there's just more job instability, there's more uh, scheduling instability, uh, there's a lot of dynamics here. Well, you know, the typical Black worker is going to be residing in a state that's providing you know, relatively you know, less in, in meaningful terms uh, for households that are you know, operating at margins um, in unemployment insurance, right? So this, this goes beyond uh, the traditional welfare system. And so we, we kind of see this robust finding um, and I'm only focusing on a few programs here. Now, historically, and, and in the work with uh, Trevon and John, we tried to think hard about you know, how we could synthesize some of the broader regional trends. And, and look, you know, there are regional gaps with respect to um, per capita income. And here, basically, a region having a ratio above one means that you know, the per capita income is above the national average, below one is, is below the national average. And so you can see some evidence of initially pretty pretty you know, qualitatively larger levels of regional inequality that do converge since the 1930s. You see a bit of a widening between say the Northeast and the South, you know, right around 1990. Um, but you know, overall there's a convergence there. Um, so again, there, there are some you know, core differences. There's no doubt that say for example, the Northeast corridor uh, dominated by relatively high compensation job opportunities in government and the, the finance sector, right? So that's a very unique feature of the Mid-Atlantic. Can we call New York the Mid-Atlantic? What do we call New York? You all Mid-Atlantic? Yeah, right. 
you see where I'm from, where I grew up, once you crossed over Maryland into DC, you were just in the north, right? Like that's that's what we thought of it. But you know, I'm I'm told there's a thing about how we handle snow and it's all very complicated. So we don't do snow well in DC. But and nevertheless, um, you know, back on track here, it's just to say that we we do have these broader historical trends uh, that do emerge, right? Um, and again, it's important to think about this, even with the South lagging other regions on per capita income, you know, you do have cities that are quite successful and prosperous. Uh, the Raleigh-Durham metro area where I'm from is a nice example. Um, certainly cities like Atlanta, uh, Nashville, Birmingham, um, you know, absolutely um, looking well on broad aggregate trends. But again, there's oftentimes an underlying inequality story at the city level that can be troubling as well. Uh, Charlotte comes to mind also. And so many of our areas in the, in the US, they see inequality and they might think about it as a current period snapshot, but in fact, uh, many areas have been grappling with issues of uh, persistent poverty and inequality for decades. Um, and so, um, you know, my collaborator, Robert Hartley, is in the audience, and um, many of my former professors and grad student friends at the University of Kentucky, um, they've thought about this issue, um, thinking about some of the predictors of persistent poverty and just sort of grabbing a, an image from their study. One of the things that does come through is that on the one hand, look, I'm focused very much on certain aspects of racial inequality and state policy, um, but you know, the the challenge with exposure to poverty, it's cross-cutting uh, across race and ethnicity. And you can even see here, for example, um, you know, persistent poverty in areas like Eastern Kentucky and Appalachia. And this is very much affecting um, disproportionately in that region, uh, you know, white Americans, right? And so, you know, it's, it's not a one size fits all story. It's complex and there's like quite a bit of dynamics. But for some of these communities, it's not so dynamic. The communities have been poor on statistical level and they remain poor, right? Um, and so, you know, what's driving all this, and I wouldn't claim to be able to tell you the answer, but, you know, there is a historical aspect to this. Um, I'm an economist by training. I tried hard not to have a regression table. There's only one regression table, but you don't have to worry about reading the regression table. The main point is that. I just want to convince you that we look at one disturbing historical factor in the nation's history, which was the incidence of racial violence against Black Americans, lynchings. And, and so this was pervasive during the Jim Crow era uh, in the US. And we do have data on the incidence of lynchings at the state level. And so when we plotted that historical data and then lined it up with interesting data on um, unions, worker protections, and an array of state policies, states that are able to provide refundable tax credits for their, their working poor and near poor, states that might want to do better on the state minimum wage relative to the federal, uh, states that are going to provide more in the way of cash assistance or so-called basic assistance, the unemployment rate aggregate measures of state growth, poverty rate. And for all but kind of the aggregate measure of state, state growth, we just essentially see this strong relationship where these states with higher levels of historical racial violence simply seem to look worse. And that's a qualitative statement on my part. That's my assessment and folks might disagree on this, but you know, my reading is that they look worse on these sorts of social welfare policies, right? And so there is something going on here with race. Um, the relationship is robust, it's strong, it's, it's been uncovered across multiple studies. And again, I wanna argue that one of the reasons we should be concerned is that you've got states that in many instances have the autonomy to use federal dollars and in those choices and preferences, they're actually not doing what they could be doing to reduce within state inequality, right? And so that's a choice. We see differences in how states are handling these things. 
And we do have increasingly building evidence that, again, I kind of led with this idea of inequality in an intergenerational sense, that these sorts of investments, income supports, they're not just important for intragenerational mobility, but it's very much important for moving kids up and out of uh, poverty and inequality so that they can lead, um, you know, sort of productive, happier, comfortable lives, healthy lives as adults themselves. And so the, the resources do matter quite a bit in those childhood years. Now, my view is that the federal policy apparatus matters greatly. Um, and, you know, frankly, in the history uh, of America and the, the history of Black families throughout the U.S., um, federal policy has sometimes been quite harmful. And you could think about Plessy versus Ferguson uh, going back into the 1800s. But federal policies have also oftentimes intervened, uh, maybe when states were not doing the right thing. Now, today, on the metric of income support and social welfare policies, we have examples where there are strong, durable federal policies that have made a difference. And so I'm thinking about the American Rescue Plan. Certainly, that included the expanded 2021 child tax credit, fully refundable. Really, some of the dynamic and cutting edge work on this CTC has occurred right here uh, in the School of Social Work at Columbia. But also, uh, updating to food assistance programs and how we define uh, food insecurity, resulting in a, a big boost uh, to the so-called SNAP benefits, uh, food assistance, uh, food stamp benefits. And so kind of taken together, we had this large infusion of benefits uh, that families experienced uh, during, the, during the pandemic, right? Um, and you could list them off, right? Child tax credit, SNAP program, um, some expansions to the earned income credit as well, and obviously these, these really beneficial economic impact payments. And so, you know, again, I think a lot of the discourse over the past year has been in part around the role of these infusions as a potential driver of inflation. Uh, this is not a talk about inflation. What I would just say is that if you look at some of the work from folks like Mark Zandi and others, it turns out that this is just a more complex story. Um, much of the inflation story is a supply issue, um, supply of workers, uh, supply of, of capital and resources, uh, resource flows globally, uh, supply chain bottlenecks, things like this. Um, those are big drivers, um, you know, security and stability, war in Ukraine. Those things have to be put into the mix. And, and so, I, you know, again, my view is that these were the right investments to make. And importantly, they were federal policy investments. And so many of the residents in these states with relatively weaker safety nets were able to benefit from these sorts of inputs. This is some of what this looks like. And the short version is that for, I think, what is our most important resource, children, uh, they are the productive engine of the future. You know, um, I'm a good Presbyterian, so I can make the moral argument but I have an economist hat on right now. So efficiency wise, um, investing in kids makes great sense and lowering child poverty um, is a great investment. And based on a statistical measure from the US Census Bureau on so-called supplemental poverty, we, we did historically well when we made the, those aforementioned investments. So historic reductions in child poverty uh, across race and ethnicity. I want to shift gears here as we close out and um, maybe get some questions from here in the room or online to just kind of talk about some of the ways that folks can think about assessing benefits, perhaps at the local level. We've talked about the states, uh, but again, people are living their lives locally. And so how do we think about this? Um, I'm part of an advisory group for an exciting program at the Aspen Institute um, within their financial security program. And so they have an initiative that they've launched called Benefits 21. And so Benefits 21 is really all about trying to think about uh, developing a rubric to assess the whole array of public and private benefits. I thought one of the great points that they make, um, you know, Sarika Abi and her 
you know, collaborators at Aspen, one of the great points they make is that, you know, I get up here and I'm talking about benefits in the context of families facing low income. Really, probably almost everyone in the room relies upon some form of benefits, right? They, they provide a backstop, they provide a safety net. There's all sorts of unanticipated events that can occur, an injury, uh, so on and so forth, that could dramatically shape your ability to, to work and make ends meet. And so I think their exercise is an interesting you know, moment and an opportunity to try to lay out a whole array of public and private benefits and make some assessments about whether and how they can be more effective. How do you score these things? And so I'm gonna argue that many of the folks who are thinking about this, whether at a 30,000 foot level, the way I oftentimes do, or whether you're more on the ground, if you're thinking about your, your clients and their families, uh, you're working at the case manager level, this understanding is gonna be really important in terms of improving the lives of, of your clients and your families. And so again, you know, I just wanna kind of highlight some of this work. I love this point across the spectrum in terms of income and wealth, folks really are using benefits to achieve some form of financial security. And so it could be income stability, it could be protection in the event of some sort of health event, um, building wealth for retirement or other you know, big ticket items that you have in your, your life. These things all sort of come together and matter greatly. And I would even argue that some of the best workforce initiatives right now, um, and you can think about a lot of workforce programs under the, the work advance model, they actually do tend to have a wraparound component where you have supports in place to help the worker think about how they can access an array of benefits, how can they secure their housing. So it's not just simply placing people in the jobs, but it's thinking about this whole wraparound and, and some of us are maybe fortunate enough to have uh, our own private safety nets. Maybe it's families. Um, my brother's a GI doctor, right? He'd probably give me grief, but he'd help me if he had to, right? Um, you don't wanna ask your older brother for help. So, yeah. so like, but it's an important thing, right? So folks don't always have that to, to lean on and it's an important point. Um, so they have this sco scorecard and they want to think about this uh, along the uh, dimensions of sort of usability, um, the dollar benefit, how these programs interact with one another. And my point isn't to say that uh, the financial security program necessarily has it right or wrong, um, but I think it's a useful exercise. And again, I, I direct folks to the financial security programs page, but they actually start off with TANF. And I spend a lot of time talking about TANF. As you can see, they're, they're not particularly uh, keen on the program. So there's a lot of needs improvement here. But what you might do in your own local context is think about the TANF program within your specific state. So, you know, I think many experts would come to agreement with the Aspen team on their sort of macro assessment of the program. But realistically, I mean, if I toggle back here, you know, we're talking about ultimately an array of different programs in terms of how they're handling, you know, things like coverage, for example, right? So it's probably not one story, but you're talking about, you know, 50 stories. And so I think ultimately many of the folks within our social work community can leverage these types of tools that are pretty new uh, to think about the sorts of programs that families have access to, even think about some of the barriers that they're likely to face we can help them more effectively. You know, that, that's my hope at least. So just some concluding ideas, you know, just to sum it up, I think that these weaker safety nets are, are very much linked to race. Um, that's not the whole story, but I also think that there's durable quantitative evidence uh, that supports this. I would also call out the, the outstanding work of folks like Carolyn Barnes at Duke University They've been doing a lot of the, the qualitative work, uh, case study work to think hard about the context, uh, uh, the experience that families have interacting with the social welfare system, particularly within the South. And again, I've shown you these aggregate statistics uh, that paint certain aspects uh, of interacting with the safety net in the South, South poorly, but there's great variation. 
And so a lot of her work, again, takes it down from that relative 30,000 foot view and, and really gets at the fact that there's wildly different experience, uh, experiences within many of these, these states and cities, right? So it's, it's you know, less of a wide brush. And so I definitely direct folks to that work as well. Um, but I think that the, the social sciences evidence on the long-term benefits and returns to income support really do recommend a pretty robust and aggressive federal investment in these sorts of programs. There's probably political and other sort of practicality reasons that we're currently doing this through the tax system. You don't have to do it through the tax system, but we are doing this through a series of refundable tax credits. Um, that seems like a, a useful vehicle right now. Um, and so I think that there's, there's good support for, for going in this direction. Um, and then I would just say that, you know, ultimately it's gonna be about in part a stronger federal safety net and then perhaps potentially guardrails. You know, sometimes it's not necessarily new spending. It might even just be how you're spending what you currently have. And so there might be a need for some guardrails uh, with respect to uh, putting some governors on uh, state policy choices, right? And, and again, you can point to the case study of Mississippi that just looks so, so weak on coverage um, and where that, that resource is being used in ways that I think everyone, even in that particular context, is agreeing is, is misuse. So, you know, you know, stop there and maybe we can chat a little bit about this online and in the room. So, um, thanks. Fabulous talk. Oh, thanks. Let me unmute myself. Yep. Fabulous talk. Thank you so much. Um, are there questions in the room or should I, I can, I'm happy to launch in as well. Um, I mean, I'm so glad you ended where you did because I was sort of yeah, listening to your talk and having, having had the benefit of seeing the slides in advance. I was thinking like, how much can you do to get Mississippi to change what they're doing right. versus having the yep. federal government sort of step in? Yep. yep. And as you said, there's a historical, you know, legacy of doing that. Yep. And it's both having more federal aid, but also giving states less discretion in yep. these federal programs. Because a lot of this is, they're exer as you were emphasizing, yeah. they're exercising discretion that's with right. their, how they're operating these federal programs. No, I think that's right. So I think it's and and, right? It's yeah. both the federal government doing more and yeah. it's the states, as you said, having some guardrails on the states. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. But yeah it's yeah. it's sobering it is i mean you know one one reaction jane that i have here is look we we have an opportunity to maybe unveil some of these statistics and these findings i think that probably what gets lost in this is that we can talk about you know these linkages to race and racial composition of the the welfare caseload or the state itself but i think that in the mix there's a whole host of at times uh, non-black uh, clients who oh, totally. are affected. Totally. Right. Yeah. And I think this yeah. is something that, that yeah. also has to be yeah. raised up in. Yeah. And probably in terms of how we talk about this, it's yeah. it's an important point. You know? Well, you you so, know the work obviously by like yeah. Alicina and Glazer. It's it's the yep. percent of the population that's other than white. So yep. percent that's foreign born, the percent that his, that's Hispanic, yep. it has the same kind of influence on right. state policy choices. Absolutely. Yeah. And um so yeah. Yep. This, this stuff yeah. is very robust. Yeah, you know, and I think just even the, there's a persistent story here. You know, it's it's attitudes, um, it's sort of norms that, that load on these state policy mm. choices. And so, you know, like, if I were to talk to some friends across uh, campus in history, for example, you know, they would be completely unmoved by this finding. Yeah. They would sort of say, well, yeah, I, I expect that. I expect yeah. that. Um, some of these policy preferences yeah. come through in this way, yeah. right? And um, you know, even even my in my you know my childhood state, which I love, I love North Carolina, and I mean, we had a a, a famous uh, senator who would oftentimes very explicitly mm -hmm. um, use the valence of race mm -hmm. um, in I think pretty pernicious ways, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, 
actually have a great social studies uh, class trip picture with him in my office. Right? So, thank you guys. Yeah. I'm also so glad you called out the qualitative research about what happens at the front lines yeah. because um, that is fabulous work. And yep. there's actually a really rich history of that work in New York City going way back when to oh, like wow. Piven and Cloward who okay. were here at the School of Social Work. And then more recently, Vicki Lenz. Yep. Um, New York City has a tradition that's referred to as churning, which is getting people off the caseloads. Yep. As you were talking about, you miss a yep. certificate, you, you don't have the right paperwork, you miss a training session, you miss a job interview, right. you get cut off the rolls, and they hope that you don't come back right. because the administrative hassle will keep you off the rolls. And it was a deliberate right. strategy yep. uh, to keep people off and yep. um, trip them up. Yeah, And so, yeah, it's it's not just a phenomenon in the South. It's right. like, exactly. And that, the qualitative work on this is fabulous in terms of fleshing it out. Yeah, the and, zoom in, right? I yeah. think the zoom in is so important. Yeah. I mean, even just thinking about the, the context of, of, of some uh, policymakers and policy analysts who might find themselves within the, the, the state government apparatus. And again, you know, there is the issue I learned about years ago about sort of funding supplantation. And the idea that with with access to this uh, maybe relatively unregulated pot of funds, you can use that to plug holes in other parts of your budget. Yeah. Right. And yeah. and so it's difficult. And I think again, the the case study out of Mississippi just kind of makes the point that well, it's difficult to fully monitor these things. Yeah. Um, it could yeah. have serious impacts on, on family well being. Yeah. Um, but you can also see where. Um, a budget analyst might have the incentive, right? They might have the incentive to think hard and they might even think they're doing the right thing in some cases. And so I think, yeah. you know, again, like even the story about cash assistance and, I'm, and I'm, I think there's a pretty clear pattern here. Absolutely, I think there's a, there's a broader point that there are some uses within the, the traditional welfare block grant that aren't necessarily cash spending, yeah. um, but it is an important piece of actually providing a safety yeah. net. So. Uh, so questions, we could chat all day, Brenda. So I'm curious about what you said about the Lord being parts of the South. And yeah. I know historically we have this whole great migration of African Americans yep. who were part of the Southern Black Belt who come up here. Yep. Is there anything you can help us understand about who stayed, who didn't migrate, and what what that means for the economic viability of, of the Black Belt. Any thoughts about that, like in terms of education level, unemployment rate, and even you described, you know, Black people being able to go in government. I'm from DC too, by yep. the way. We call it good government jobs. And that mm -hmm. helps you to get economic yep. ability. Um, what can you help us think about in terms of who we made and what this means in terms of their economic viability? Yeah, it's 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 a great question. And just even thinking about again, geographic mobility among all Americans and, and black Americans in particular, what does that mean for, for growth and mobility of families? Um and and so I can speak to part of this. Uh my collaborator Marcus Casey, who's at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and I Several years back, we were motivated by the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission. Kerner Commission was focused on uh, civil unrest throughout the mid 1960s and uh, you know civil disturbances um, in many Northeast and Midwest cities uh, around issues of housing, uh, police misconduct, uh, and you know inaccessibility of jobs uh, for many Black Americans. And so this was a presidentially appointed commission. We just wanted to understand the trajectory of neighborhoods with large concentrations of black residents, including those that really did have the event of so-called riots occurring throughout the 60s. We wanted to see how those neighborhoods fared. Well, one of the things that we discovered in the course of our research and our quantitative analysis was that, look, many of these families that moved north to cities like Milwaukee, Chicago, moved west to Los Angeles, moved to New York. Well, they really did replace one form of inequality in the South mm -hmm. uh, with relative geographic isolation uh, within very high poverty neighborhoods outside of the South. That wasn't uniformly the case. Mm 
But I think that what we learned in sort of a neighborhood analysis uh, was that the migration uh, did not yield uh, great returns for all families. Some families did quite well in this, in this migration. Um, you know, I, I think that ultimately, you know, my view is that the households who were able to leverage higher education opportunities, who were able to leverage opportunities with many of the anchor employers within their local or regional uh, area, whether that was auto manufacturing, whether that was the federal government apparatus, we definitely see clear evidence that those households uh, performed right, what, quite well in terms of their economic status and then economic mobility. I mean, to this day, I'm fairly confident that Prince George's County in the DC metro area is still, if not the most prosperous county for black families, it must be nearly the most mm -hmm. prosperous one. And it's hard to decouple that from uh, the federal government and the opening up of job opportunities within the federal government. Um, I think a related concern, and this is something that a, a doctoral student probably is working on or should work on, is that there's been more attention in the past couple of decades to bringing accountability metrics to more forms of public sector work. And this has been done quite a bit in, in education, uh, but a lot of this has been coming to sectors like your, your bus conductors and drivers and things like this, mm. and productivity measures. Well, the productivity measures, even in the education space, you could go across the street to teacher's college. Many of those scholars would tell you, it turns out a lot of those, those productivity measures are, are, are somewhat flawed, um, but it does raise the specter of potentially displacing many workers, many who are um, uh, black. So I think there's a lot to think about there. Um, hope I've answered part of your question. Yes. So I'm looking at Larita because I know that there's a lot of people online. And so I want to be sure that if there's any questions that we make space for them. Yeah. Is there a way to compete with larger historical and systematic ideologies within the US? Pulling ourselves up from our bootstraps for have mentality, atrocity, and capitalistic racism. Can um, how might these important and powerful data influence these kinds of integrated ideologies that so often di dictate the ways social welfare policies are applied within and across states? So I really like this question, and I'm going to paraphrase a uh, uh, from probably my alma mater's uh, best known graduate, Martin Luther King. Um, he was speaking back in the 60s about issues of economic mobility and, and race. And he kind of made the point that it was a really cruel joke to ask a, a person to lift themselves up by their bootstraps when they don't have any boots to begin with. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, I really like this point. A lot of these themes around the hostility uh, to redistribution um, do come through, I think, in part from some misguided uh, ideas, and I'm generalizing, uh, around how many folks came to have what they have in the first place. I happen to think it's usually an interaction of, of hard work and uh, some opportunities mm -hmm. that folks were given. Typically, you don't do anything alone in this world. That, that's just my own view. Um, so, you know, the question is a great one. Because I think what it means is that there are instances in which policy needs to intervene at a higher level, right? And sometimes there's just, there's just bad local policy. There's just bad state mm -hmm. policy, right? That's just my, my opinion. Uh, but based on what I've set forth as optimal policy, and you've just heard that, I think that there's a clear argument that we can move the needle. We can move the needle when we intervene at a more national level on some mm -hmm. of these issues. Now, there's still work to be done. I showed you these poverty reductions for children across race and ethnicity. Yeah. You gotta make sure the families are able to take up the tax credit benefit. We have some evidence that many of the households we wanna target may not be filing for taxes at the rates that we'd want them to, right? So there has to be full knowledge and awareness of this benefit if we are to make this permanent and have it be as effective as possible. So there's always challenges yeah. to do this at the federal level, the way we're talking about. Uh, but again, I, I wanna argue that 
we don't talk as much as we should about what really does work. And, you know, it's kind of a boring looking trend line, but that means uh, improved well being for many, many US households. So, other questions, Zinnerman? Also, do you want to? I think we can sit down if you okay, want. Okay, sure. And, you know, what the heck? Yeah. We're just, you know, you say so. <laughs> what the heck? Melissa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a terrific talk, Dr. Hardy, and for sharing all this great data. Um, I firmly believe data can be a tool for social justice, and I think you're doing that. So thank you. Um, I'm really intrigued by this notion of stronger federal policy kind of yeah. mitigating the questionable, problematic um, implementation that's happening at the state and, and local levels. And so then I'm, my, my mind is leaping to the next stage of, well, what do we do then to convince the the federal legislators right and there's so much mm -hmm. there's still so many mis we, there's like great data out there that shows all the things that we can do and there's still these these misperceptions right a, a, about what people when you aid people what they're going to do with yeah. the money and i'm thinking of that one u.s senator mm -hmm. who said mm -hmm. right with mm -hmm. that or, Who's the child the tax credit that you singled out yeah. right you know yeah. the, the, the parents will go out and spend it on drugs right, right. that you know, so and yeah. like how can you look at all this data and still say that but i, I don't know that's it's not really what you were talking about today but but it's making yeah, me curious if you have any thoughts or you, yeah. you know about how to, how do we overcome those very um stubborn yeah. and and yeah. highly inaccurate misperceptions. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, look, I could speak to like part, part of this issue, right? I think part of this issue can be solved and there's political scientists who've thought even harder about this, but there's something to be said if you were just thinking about this as a student of political science. Um, you know, there are probably policymakers and elected officials from some states who need more coverage, if you will, uh, I've been using that word a lot, yeah. than others. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine that a, a, a party that is more amenable to redistribution, if they are able to have more of a cushion within say the Senate and or the House, then that allows for ostensibly more conservative members of that party uh, to protect themselves on certain votes. And that would give some run runway for the party to still advance some of these, these policy initiatives, right? And so I think there's also space for some negotiation. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'd have to think harder about what negotiation looks like, but mm -hmm. even on something like the, the refundable child tax credit in 2021, my sense is that there are ongoing opportunities to make some compromises where you still might be able to move the needle on child poverty on a permanent basis. And you might get to give some of the opponents of that type of policy a little bit of what they want within the tax code. So, I mean, again, there's- This, this is the yeah. live question of the moment, right, right? right? Exactly. This is way beyond my pay grade. Right. The question of the lame duck session. Yep. And the Republicans want some things in terms of their tax policies and the Democrats do as well around the child tax credit. Right. And they're all looking at a divided Congress starting in January. So is there something that they can compromise on now? Right. Yeah, that's right. right. So do you have a crystal ball about what, <laughs> what's right, going to happen ball. with the child tax credit? Yeah, I mean, absolutely not. It, it's, it's, <laughs> oh, so sorry. The, uh, you know, it's, it's, but I would say, I, I do think that there is something around messaging to make the point that this has had broad positive impacts uh, for many, you know, for many U.S. families and households. And you know, again, I think there's people who think harder about the messaging and marketing, uh, right? And but people know the evidence cold, yeah. But you know, yeah. I, I hope to see more of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a great point, though. Politicians never listen to science. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we've had this debate a lot here. We at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy, we've, as you know, we've been doing, because you meet with us, we've been yep. doing a lot of work on the child tax credit yep. and estimating its impacts on everything yep. poverty, food insecurity, financial hardship, parents' mental health, well being, how families are spending the money. Are they spending it on things for kids? The good right. news is that they are. They're mm -hmm. spending it on things for kids. 
And so we could easily estimate, are they spending it on alcohol and tobacco? Right. We could easily estimate that. We could even probably do some estimates around, are they spending it on drugs? And so we keep having these conversations. If we produce that evidence, even if we produce a study where the title is, the headline is, families are not spending the child tax credit on drugs or alcohol or tobacco, would that influence policymakers? Or does it, even just releasing a study with those words, does it, does it just give more juice to the idea that parents might spend the money on alcohol yeah. and drugs and tobacco? And are politicians gonna believe that evidence or are they not? And so every time we've looked at it, we've actually taken a step back and said, we're not doing that study. Yeah. Because it's just going to give more air yeah. to the idea that um, yeah. that there's a question about how people would spend the money that's earmarked for kids. Uh, but I'm still not sure that we've made the right decision on that. No, I mean this uh, is yeah. I mean, I think, what, what we yeah. all do for a living, and, yeah. and you know, the the reason for our work is all of us is that we do this work because we hope to influence public yep. policy. So I think I like think we can pivot, and you know, we always have to go back and think hard about. The current situation, maybe something that didn't make sense six months ago, maybe re reevaluate it. Yeah. And it's hard. I mean, I think, look, even within my little narrow world of teaching public finance, one of the things I've noticed is that the, the theme of worrying about so called moral hazard from any form of receiving a benefit or cash payment, that's a big part of the standard kind of public finance curriculum. And look, I think, you know, we, we think there's a lot of things people can do uh, that happen to be productive, that's not necessarily work. But we, I think we also have, in my reading of the evidence, uh, results that show that people don't fully pull back from work when they receive transfers. That's just mm -hmm. not the case mm -hmm. for a whole host of reasons. Yeah. But what we haven't done in the public finance literature, and there was great work, I want to say, Hillary Hoynes has a, a nice paper with co-authors on this, just kind of making the point that even within economic policy, we have to think about a new public finance that talks about not just the potential work disincentive, but line that up with the long-term efficiency benefits. And again, I, I could beat the drum about the reasons why I think it's the right thing, but there's sort of efficiency benefits to investing in, in kids. Um, they end up being more productive as adults and that's a benefit to society writ large. Mm -hmm. And just talking about that evidence also. Yeah. Chris. Uh, okay. um, so yeah, thank you, Bradley. Um, the, you spent a lot of time on, on TANF and then a bit of time on unemployment yeah. insurance, but um, you know, the US's safety net is so fragmented into so many different programs by different agencies, different levels of government. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if there's any work that tries to understand how generosity in one program yeah. correlates or how strong or how tightly linked it is with generosity yeah. across other programs. Um, and you know it'd be interesting either way, I think, right? If there if there were, you know, states yeah. that um, were yeah. were super generous on one, you know, sort of lagging behind on the other, or if these things all go together hand in hand. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in part, when you're talking, I'm like, we should work on that. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, these reactions, right? Yeah. I mean, like I've got some descriptive work suggesting, and some of this popped up in that very messy regression table, suggesting that there is some bundling of these policies, right? It's yeah. not one for one, but there is some bundling there. We see that. Um, but I think there's more work to be done to think about whether there's some responsiveness uh, between policies. I started to look at some of this with my former colleague at AU, uh, Jocelyn uh, Johnson, and some students, but I think there's more work to be done there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so there's someone tuning in from Abuja, Nigeria, who um, has a comment and a question. Okay. It is true that lives are lived locally, yet policy authority typically occurs at higher levels of government. Yes. Um, she would add to that and say, yet policy authority is typically made by higher levels of ignorant and often detached from reality government officials. And so how can policymaking be made available for voting before it can be passed for people to follow, as opposed to leaving it in the hands of a few mostly just theoretical and detached individuals. 
you, you know, it's an interesting thing. My view is that in part in the US context, we have a salience problem where many residents, and I think in part because of our, our lives, our lives at times are very busy. They can be chaotic. There's quite a bit going on. It's, it's easy to think about a lot of the things that work that you maybe wish worked better, but because they've always been around, you don't think they can go away. And, and so, you know, what I would argue is that across states, including the Southern states, you have people of, of very good will mm -hmm. who are working in human services agencies uh, to stand up a whole array of, of policies and programs um, that, that do make a difference. And, you know, if you talk to some folks who are beneficiaries of school meal programs, for example, housing assistance, uh, emergency housing assistance, they'll, they'll point to those interventions, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean they're perfect. And, and so I think in part, just my view, and this is a little bit out of the domain of my direct work, is that we have to do a better job of messaging much of what the U.S. social welfare system gets right. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we have a very imperfect society, um, but we are also a, a country uh, that many people seek out. Mm -hmm. And we do have protections uh, that, that do make a difference. And so I think sometimes it's hard. I spend a lot of my research career highlighting what maybe is inequitable, maybe what's not working, but many of these programs are making a big difference. And so um, the only other thing I would say is that, um, you know, I just hope, and again, our friends in political science are, are even better equipped at this than I am, but there's always going to be an important space for uh, voter participation. And I do think, and, you know, uh, Jane and I were talking about this earlier in the afternoon, there is going to need to be action at the state level with respect to political engagement. So part of my argument is, well, you know, we've got these state problems, they're pernicious, we need a federal intervention. But I think, you know, I could be pushed on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. There's probably more of a need for some grassroots efforts at the state level. Um, we've seen some fantastic work at the, the ground level on the part of folks like Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. uh, to mobilize voters. And I think that that's, that's certainly a space. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it was just a couple of years ago, there were no state supplements to the child tax credit that we've been yeah. talking about. And I learned yesterday at lunch from Sophie that there's 10 states now that have state supplements to the child tax oh, wow. credit, including a pretty generous one in California for young kids. Where, you know, last time I looked at it a few years ago, there was one state. So, um, and especially, you know, we were talking this afternoon, especially looking into the next couple of years where Congress is going to be divided. Yep. yep. Like, where do you, that's right. Where do you try to have leverage and where do you try to make change? Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this question of messaging and framing, you know, your colleague yep. at Bill Gormley at yep. George, Georgetown, who I, who I work, I really admire yep. did those experiments years ago, those vignette studies mm -hmm. where he showed people like sort of phony, they were newspaper articles where he wrote about programs as these are investments in kids, or these help parents go to work, mm -hmm. or these help promote child health, or these help close achievement gaps. And then he was able to, by using yep. these vignettes, see who responded positively to them from different groups. Right. And there's a lot of information in that. Yep. So, um, you know, the child tax credit, as you showed, was a huge success in right. reducing child poverty. Yep. But how many Americans have heard about it and what would they say it is? Right. Was it temporary COVID assistance? Is it an investment right. in kids? Is it an anti-poverty policy? Is it helping families uh, have freedom of, of, you know, have the children that they want to have and make their own choices? You know, sort of libertarian arguments about um, giving families choices, putting money in the hands of yeah. parents who are best positioned to use it. Those are really different arguments. So which of those arguments have people heard? Which ones are salient for which groups? Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, there could be states where you can move the needle on it. Uh, yeah. Mississippi, <laughs> I don't know how you're ever going to move Mississippi. I think, but, you know, and the thing, you, you know, know people, whoever would have thought right. Georgia would move. Exactly. You know? So I think it's, 
you know, people always say if you, if you can happen in New York, if you can do it in New York, you can do, do it, it anywhere. anywhere. Right. This will now be the new mantra. If you can do it in Georgia, you can, you can do, it, do, it do it anywhere. That's right. No, it's, um, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah. You, you have to, it's like, it's where we were talking about it earlier. It's and, and you have yep. to do it at the local level. You have to get people aware yep. of these programs to make sure they know about them and that they're empowered to go and get them. Yep. And, and if that, if they get chucked off, they get back on yep. and it's the state level and it's also the federal government, yeah. you know, coming in as a monitor and also not giving states so much discretion. Yeah. And it's all of these yeah. things. No, it's in new ideas. I mean, you know, a, yeah. a new generation of uh, social welfare, social work and policy uh, analysts and thinkers will come up with new ideas. I came across a study in another country context and essentially the, the bottom line is that they bumped up tax compliance dramatically and uh, the mechanism was to attach vignettes and pictures that you know showed the, the tax filer how their tax payments were going to be used. So wow pictures of schools being built, roads being fixed, wow. things like this. And they were able to link that with um, large increases in, in actual tax filing and compliance. Wow. This is another country. Wow, um, yeah. So, but but the, the, the results are dramatic. Does that generalize to the US? Who knows? But I think the point is that, look, we, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we're, you know, we're not necessarily thinking about public policy when we go to the bar or the grocery store, right? But, oh, but these I things am. matter. Yeah. Okay, right, right, right. We are. Us. We are. Right. We're thinking about it all the time. I'm willing, willing to allow that not everybody's doing that. Uh, so, yeah. Um, no, so I think there's potential for, for improvement. Yeah. And that's why it's great to have folks coming in. Um, and they're going to add to our ideas. And, yeah. and, and so I think there's hope. Yeah. Other? Rob? wasn't sure how good we are on time. This is a great discussion. And thanks for the presentation, Bradley. So yeah. you, you did some motivation up front about uh, the within state variation in mobility and even within yeah. city, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah. And then you said there may be issues when it comes to like data availability, when it comes down to um, sure. trying to analyze these differences. Yeah. Um, but when I was thinking about the churning question, Jane, like I... Yep. I, I always think of, okay, you can have a federal policy. It, the churning can be like a state decision, like all the offices, we want to get numbers to yeah. certain levels. Yeah. But what what are the ways that you, you, you've you thought about how this can actually happen at even local levels? Yeah. Differences in, I mean, I think about governor turnover, you may have changes in regimes, yep. but at the local level, how much variation do you think that there is? What what are the other constraints yeah. besides data that might come into play? Right. I mean, like, so on some level, right, like there's this, you know, the, the ease of data acquisition, you know, right now, don't, don't make me do it as a pop quiz, but I could, I could pull up state level data and we could basically think about how we could create kind of a time series or a panel of state information, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I think that there is kind of a wonkish discussion around data sharing at say the city level mm -hmm. between different agencies and divisions. And you're seeing this happen. I think, you know, folks are doing some of this here in New York City. And so there are going to be larger cities. Seattle comes to mind and there's a great group of researchers at the University of Washington who are able to think about kind of interoperability of programs within the city. So we can learn more at a city or metro level, absolutely. I think it takes folks on the ground who can see the payoff. I mean, again, I think one of the challenges when you start getting into say a lot of administrative data, you, you always wanna convince the stakeholders that there's a clear learning payoff because mm -hmm. now you're dealing with more sensitive micro data, people's information. So there's always that, that tension there um, but I do think that the broader point you're making in part is that, you know, again, and Carolyn Barnes is thinking about a lot of this work among others. Um, my colleagues at Georgetown, uh, Pam Hurd and Don Moynihan think yeah. about this a lot as well. Yeah. There's a, quite a bit of caseworker discretion at the local level. That has all sorts of important consequences for inequality and policy outcomes, how a family's treated when they go into the welfare office uh, for benefits, for example, right? And so it's happening. I think it's just a matter of whether and how we can document it. Mm 
And, you know, quite humbly, I would say this is where at times my quantitative skill set, it may not even be fully lent uh, or sort of fully capable of investigating the problem. It's mm -hmm. part of the solution, but this is where a lot of the interview and qualitative methods, I think, are really useful as well. So um, that said, I, I do want to work on some more city level stuff. And I have been working with some great people in the District of Columbia mm -hmm. tax office uh, on thinking about inequality at the city level and at the ward level and leveraging some of the tax information there to think hard about uh, some of the challenges DC faces. DC has, I think, probably tied for uh, the nation's most aggressive local uh, refundable credit for, for working poor families, families with, mm -hmm. with low income. Um, yeah. Other questions? I don't know how we're doing for time. We're good. There's there's one comment, um, which I can read out. Um, I, I really appreciate your repeated reminder to not lose sight of the things that are done well. So thank you yeah. for raising that. Uh, the media and social media can make it easy to think otherwise, not only because it helps from a resilience standpoint, speaking as a social worker, but also to ensure that we use that data and information to move the needle further. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah, really important yeah. to emphasize. Chris, yeah. Um, so the other part of the question that I was after earlier was sort of thinking about states and populations over time, because yeah. um, these are sort of static, you know, correlations across okay. states. Um, but there's been, you know, as Brenda's comment, uh, you know, illustrated there's there's a lot of movement of people across states and yep. places over time and, and it's not necessarily rapid change although sometimes yep. it's quicker than others yep. and and i wonder if there's anything we know about how generosity and related elements yeah. of policy making change as populations and relative sizes of populations change yeah you know there's probably folks even in this room who could who could add to this now, part of this question in the labor economics world is around a concept that folks call welfare migration, mm -hmm. right? And the concept there would be that, well, hey, look, if you, if you stand up a very generous social mm -hmm. welfare state, then this could be really costly because you might attract more residents who, who need those benefits. And my reading of the literature there is that we haven't seen strong evidence that that occurs. Now, that's mm -hmm. only part of the story. Um, I might argue that these sorts of supports are actually good economic development policy. Um, I'm cautious to make a causal statement, but if you were to think about this from a broad regional basis, you know, it does appear that many of these states that are not particularly generous on these sorts of supports appear to have relatively weaker economies on some aggregate measures, unemployment, mm -hmm. poverty, and the like. Mm -hmm. So there's probably more work to be done there. Um, and depending on who you talk to, I would imagine they think about this as an economic support, or they'd say, well, this, this, could, this could cause sort of a, a, negative, a negative welfare mm -hmm. migration. Yeah. On that latter point, though, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think, I mean, Jane, you know, I, you know, my view, I haven't seen much evidence to suggest that we see this. People no, talk no, no. about moment, Oh, no, 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 no. Right? Yeah, like, no, Neeraj Koshal's done yeah. a lot of work on that. No, I was thinking, yeah. I think Alicina and Glazer in, in their work about the impact of population composition on welfare generosity, I think they have yeah. some stuff where they, they leverage change in population. Yeah. Okay. I, I think some of their stuff does leverage change. But yeah. I was thinking that as you were talking, it's, um, I think there probably is an argument to be made and a case to be made that states that have had paltry benefits have then, for the reasons you were talking about, yeah. have kids who then grow on to go up to be less productive citizens yep. and more in need of benefits in future right. and let, pay less in taxes yeah. and all that. And the flip side would be states that have been more generous than have populations that are more productive in future. Yeah. So then I was thinking about there's this weird anomaly. You know, you're, there's this pattern that you've documented so clearly of the links between racial composition and welfare state generosity. And it's absolutely robust. And yep. then there's this weird anomaly, which is pre-kindergarten. Yep. So what are the states that early yeah. 
implemented universal pre-K, Oklahoma, yeah. Yeah. Arkansas, Texas, uh -huh. Florida, Georgia. Mm -hmm. So why did they do it? They did it. Yeah. They did it, I think, because they had a bunch of kids who were showing up at kindergarten who were costing them a fortune. Yeah. Kids are showing up in kindergarten. They're not prepared for school. They're getting held back. So that's an extra year of schooling and or referred to special ed. And it's just, it's, it's brutal. And so they were convinced that this is a sound investment, doesn't cost much money. But it, isn't it interesting that it was those states? I think it's, I think it's super interesting. So that's like yeah. a super interesting yeah. anomaly. And I think there's something to be learned there because you and I were agreeing yeah. earlier, there is like no, there's no way to go down the road of like, you could change Mississippi's mind and make them more generous. Right. I'm going to hold but, out hope. But then, I mean, uh, but then what happened with, but then what happened, what happened yeah. with pre-K is just, yeah. the, you know, so there, that's an interesting case study. You know, the, I, I found myself to, you know, have the occasion to look into the history of food assistance in the food stamp program. Mm. And, you know, so this has been like, Maybe Jim McGovern and Bob Dole? Yeah. 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 So sounds right. Yeah. Like, you know, they talked about this, you know, this really, really dramatic. Um, it, it wouldn't have been 60 minutes. I'm building something here. This might have been like Charles Corral, and there might have been a CBS re special report. Yeah. And, and the, yeah. there's a documentary, like a uh, piece that kind of summarizes yeah. all this. But the bottom line is that. They showed a child on live TV dying of malnutrition. They showed the video. Yeah. And he made the point that this is America. Yeah. This child just, just died and child died of malnutrition. And this leveraged support yeah. for the food stamp program. And so, like again, like in our lifetimes, I've, you know, I may be old to some folks in this room, but I I've always known of there being food assistance programs, mm. right? Mm. I'm an 80s baby that was always there, but it wasn't always the case in its current incarnation. Mm. And so I, I do think that there's, there is probably an important point around children. Yeah. And, you know, and stories and, and stories. stories, as you were saying before, yeah. that stories are powerful. And so you think about what happened during COVID and all yeah. that footage. Yep. Families lining up in their cars for yep. food food banks. Yep. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and th that's the moment when food stamps got extended and made were made more generous, yep. and this child tax credit was made more generous. Uh, sort yeah. of the, the modern day analog of showing the child dying of malnutrition. Yeah, yeah. and and that's powerful. That's 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 difficult to see. It was difficult every yeah. time I see it. It's difficult to see. Yeah. And, and I guess the point is there are probably a large subset of U.S. families where independent of the biases that you bring to the table, and look, a lot of us are susceptible to biases, right, and preconceived notions. There's also the notion that kids don't choose where they were born. They don't choose their parents. They, they have to take what they have, right? And so I think that there's there's something there. That's my hunch, yeah. um, that there's something there around that. Yeah. Yeah. The pre-K story game is interesting, though, because I think this is an example where disciplines came together and trained it really well. Yes. We okay. had the ROI stuff from the economists. We had all the brain data with Jack Shonkoff showing yes. the brain to Congress people. Yep. We had that guy, Matt Kendall Taylor. He's like the... Yeah brilliant framer of all this early childhood yeah. stuff mm. where he's shown pictures of yeah. what you do with young children and what it is. Yeah. So you got people like in, yeah. you know, Tulsa, you got all these philanthropists who yep. bought into Hector's yeah. argument and were like, we're going to put our money there. And they pushed the states to respond. Yeah. So I think that is a good example of how you can take science and make it in a way that people relate to and they were so smart about yeah. it they knew what to say to the yeah the philanthropists they knew what to say to the business people they knew what to say to the brain people it was just massive so it was masterful no you're absolutely right and could we do the same thing with income with income for families especially with young kids yeah uh have we made that case in the same way that they made the case for pre-k mm -hmm. right. 
I mean, it's little kids. Little kids. Little kids look different though than family grown adults. Yeah. Right, it's little kids. Yeah, you have to say something about little kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I think this is the campaign we should start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is good. Well, we've started the next campaign. Yeah, right. Yeah, a lot got done here. We've got it. We've got it. Um, I, I want to thank you both. Uh, this has been an incredibly stimulating, powerful conversation. Jane, great moderating, and, and Dr. Hardy, yeah, just uh, terrific work. So important, so thoughtful, uh, and so far-reaching. So, so thank you. Is there anything you'd like to say at the very, you know, as we get ready to close out? Is there something you'd like us to take away as as the final message from from this today? Uh, just thanks for standing up these conversations. I think it's important work to to give uh, a platform for folks to come in and uh, you know, talk about these issues and. Just hopefully the school will continue to do this this important work, and that's a big part of the process. So thanks. That's great. Let's let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Thanks. 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 Thanks.